I'm here with the legendary, super cool dude, Billy Morrison. Hi, I, I don't I, know about legendary, but you know. Well, look. I've been going a long time. Legendary because it's like you were like with I all the all born every. Legendary if you just don't die. That's and, true. And keep playing, right? Yeah, basically. <laughs> so you're so talented in lots of stuff. Just to start Thank off you. with, um, art itself, acting, music. I mean, you're doing everything. It seems. Yeah. Um, and s s schedule's probably so crazy at the same time. To, yeah. To manage it is, everything. It is. I um, The way I look at things is I'm lucky enough not to be working in Walmart or 7 Eleven or dead. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no mystery. My past has been well reported on. So. The fact that I'm still here is a bonus, and so I try and fill every minute of every day with something that's going to creatively fulfill me, and that is art and acting and music and all the stuff that you, that you spoke about. So it's it's not I'm not trying to be this super all-encompassing superstar, you know. I'm yeah. just trying to keep myself from losing my mind. You know, I'm the sort of guy that needs that stuff daily to keep me from going off the rails. And it works. Because if, if you didn't have that, you'd be going in a different direction, basically. Yeah, and I proved that before I went this direction. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I don't do well in an office or behind a shop counter. You know, I just don't do well, and life starts to become something that I don't want to participate in. Not on a nice, regular human level anyway. And so I become someone else left to my own devices. So a combination of things, one of which is creativity, has helped me get many years of success and uh, sobriety and, and somewhat of a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and being humble in music is so important as well. Like, to just keep on spreading goodness. Well, yeah, music's meant to be fun. Yeah, you don't want to be around assholes all the time. Uh, no, I mean, maybe in 1983, 85, yeah. music was something that uh, encouraged the asshole in certain people. Um, I don't know, I was busy being an asshole not in the music business okay. in the 80s. You know, I was just doing exactly the same as the musicians were, but I just don't think, I think the world is a different place and I think the world doesn't need the hedonism and excess that we had in the 70s and 80s. I just don't think we need that shit now. Mm -hmm. you know? So today is better, basically. And for me it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not better for the poor, homeless people on the street or you know the, the kids that are starving or getting abused and no but for me today is a good day today I am not um, today so far what is it five o'clock I don't think I've upset anyone that's good for me that's a really good start to the day and it looks like by about midnight I will have made 15,000 people quite happy, yeah. you know, cumulatively with Billy and the band, that's what we're here to do, is make 15,000 people happy, and that, that, uh, that wasn't always the case in mm -hmm. my life anyway, you know. Going back to your art and all that stuff, you must have inherited from somewhere, is it from your family? No, or, you know what, that's a very good question, no one's actually ever asked me that before, no, as far as I can tell, a lot of my family are dead now, so m mum and dad are, are, are gone. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no particular art DNA running through my family. Really? But I think something happened to me when I was like 11, when punk rock came and yeah. I found the Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol and I learned about Andy's art and Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring. And it was, it was like 
you know, Aldous Huxley wrote The Doors of Perception, and it was like my doors of perception were opened by the Sex Pistols and Andy Warhol, and the art and music came flooding in to a great degree. And being able to do stuff, anyone can do anything. If you spend 10 years doing something yeah. every day, you're gonna get good at it. Totally so, like you know, the, te the technical aspects of it yeah. is like, I mean, I, I guess I am not bad at playing the guitar and painting, but I've been doing it a long time. And I've had many, many failures in both right. areas. So I think it's more a case of be true to yourself, what makes you happy, and just do it a lot. And if you do that, you're gonna get good at it, you know. Hmm. The touring world. Yeah. yeah. In your eyes, has it changed much, you know, either, even since COVID-19, I mean? Look around, everything. this is the touring world. Yeah. It's a nondescript brick room with a bunch of wardrobe cases and uh, a kettle and a toaster and some coffee. Mm -hmm. The touring world has always looked like this to same. me, yeah. Um, no, I know what you're saying. Um, but no, that's true what you're saying too, because you're seeing hotel rooms and, and yeah. walls, basically. Yeah. For the musician, the touring world has not changed. Yeah. Um, the truth is, some kind of travel, and it doesn't matter, at some point, if you tour enough, it doesn't matter whether it's in an Econoline van or a G6 Gulfstream private plane. Travel gets to you. Yes. Hotels, whether it's a Motel 6 or a Mandarin Oriental, it's not your own bed. Right. Yes, it's, it's better in, certain, in a certain mode of transport, but after a while, touring is touring. Travel is travel. And so for the musician, touring hasn't really changed. It's sit in a hotel room, wait for someone to say, come and sit in a dressing room, and sit and wait for someone to say, now go jump around mm -hmm. for 90 minutes and make people happy. Yeah. Which is, a, it's a fantastic job and I love doing it, but it hasn't changed. For the audience it has, for the audience it's changed. They went through a period of, there was none. I mean, I guess that was the same for us too, but you know, most musicians I know own studios. Yeah. So they, they kept busy, they were creative, they worked, they did the, the, the studio side of things. For an audience, they didn't get to go and see live music. Uh, then they went through a period of, you've got to wear a mask in a venue. I mean, that's tough, man. It was really tough. Yeah. Uh, I think the audiences suffered greatly during COVID. And it was certainly great when we came back out and started playing again. Has the audience reached its capacity yet? Like, like maxed out that they're actually starting to come in? Or are they still afraid of going in? I think... Show? Uh, my feeling, and I don't know, I'm not in the audience, but my feeling, especially on this Canadian tour, is it's done. Okay. You know, people yeah. are back. We've had sold out arenas all, all across Canada. Um, and I think even though COVID-19 is still with us, they tell us. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone's like, you know, you got to live your life. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. From my perception, everyone's back. Yeah. You know? So, Billy, tell me about your, your guitar collection. I mean, you travel with lots of guitars, I'm sure. I travel with 10 guitars. That's not bad. Is that a lot? Yeah. Well, have a look over the other side of the stage. Steve's got about 15, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I do have a big collection back, uh, back home. I mean, I, I have over 100 guitars. Um, and they are all played, that I don't own guitars that are shelved and immaculate and, uh, you know, waiting for retirement. Right. I do have some guitars that will help me in my retirement, Yeah, yeah. but I've played them and I've made records with them and I've toured with them. Uh, they just happen to be, you know, 70s Gibsons and I've got a few, few collector's pieces, but most of my guitars are workhorses I use them all mm -hmm. you know and for this tour I'm using all white I don't know why it was it was nothing particular um, my signature nags is what we call knicker cream okay. uh, it's, it's like a nicotine stained white 
and I just uh, we just designed that and it's out now and I love it it's a beautiful guitar and so you know I, I, Steve Vai gave me a white gem and I'm looking at these white guitars and my, my Gibson Les Paul signature was was an off-white and I thought fuck it we'll just do uh, white we'll do white this tour and it won't be next tour you know I've yeah. got enough guitars that I can mess around and go let's play all sunburst now you know whatever. white is a good color to I love it because I got it from Steve Jones okay Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols iconic guitar which I actually got to play was it really white or was it cream it started as a it started as a white Les Paul okay. but it, that's that's years of, of nicotine okay. uh, environments and uh, aging and it was like I say I got to play it this year it, All right. it, it went up for auction the person who owned the Nevermind the Bollocks Les Paul that Steve owned sold it at auction and okay. the auction house is a uh, very well-known auction house in Los Angeles that knows me so they asked me to make a video to play it and demonstrate it and talk about how important this guitar was so I had the the guitar that changed my life was in my hands hmm. for a whole day it looks yellow now okay and has some incredible mojo it. before that I would have said that people saying if you play Blackie or if you play one of you know one of these very important historical guitars you can feel the mojo in, and I would have said you're full of shit well I played Steve's Les Paul and there was something magical and special I think it wood is a porous material right it soaks in DNA it soaks in sweat that guitar was also owned by the New York Dolls okay Sil Sylvain it's like a legendary punk rock guitar so I couldn't help but feel the mojo in that guitar yeah that's true I forgot about that excellent documentary on Sex Pistols also yeah I, uh, I watched it loved it yeah it um, shows you the time of that era you have, you, know. to, you have to take everything in context you have to take the Velvet Underground in context you know it's 1967 you know and Andy's out there talking about transsexuals and Lou's talking about, you know, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, the New York street scene. And then you take the Sex Pistols anger in a time where Donny Osmond was on our TV, mm -hmm. you know? It was bubblegum, uh, pop, lighthearted, or really bloated, esoteric prog rock. And the Sex Pistols came in. You have to, you have to take that into account, you know, the context yeah. of what happened. I think they were the single most important rock and roll band that we've ever had. They wrote great songs too. Well, they only wrote 12. They wrote 12 songs. Name me another band that changed the course of music in one album, 12 songs, and about 19 months of career. That's all they had. Yeah, never mind the bollocks. It's kind of like a um, greatest hits album. It, and it's it was the, the album. greatest hits album, and that's all they wrote. So they I, they got it out in like two years, and that was it. Wow. That's just <laughs> incredible when you think of it like that. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> things like that happen for a reason, and that error happened for a reason, and yeah. then it just disappears, but yeah. then stays not mainstream, but also in yeah. the, the niche of it. it well, it like, does happen again. It happened again in the form of hip hop. Hip hop, which I'm a huge fan of, is exactly the same as punk rock. It was a punk rock was not a haircut; it was an attitude. It was okay. a rebellion. And what happened with the '80s with hip hop? It was a group of disenfranchised youths saying, "We don't want to take it. We want, we want some change. We need some revolution around here." And hip hop was punk rock. It was the same mm -hmm. thing. Same thing. Yeah, like the old Run DMC and stuff like that. Oh, dude, if or you put on the NWA's first album, okay, yeah. you don't get more punk rock than that album. That's mm. the most aggressively angry, violent lyrics I've ever heard in my entire life. And uh, it's real. It was recorded at a time where those kids felt that, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I was asked who my ultimate collaboration would be with, and it would be with Cube, Ice Cube. I mean, okay. the voice of a generation. Hmm. So people think I'm all about Iron Maiden. Nothing wrong. Love Iron Maiden. Love Bruce. 
but I'm more about voices of a generation like like Cube and mm -hmm. you know Rotten wow you're so well spoken to and knowledgeable how did you become an encyclopedia like um I'm not an encyclopedia. Well, you, you do carry a lot of knowledge. Well, I, I carry a lot of knowledge about the things that are important to me. Yeah. If you want to talk to me about Dizzy Gillespie, no fucking idea. Jazz leaves me cold. I know a few chords, yeah. but that's only because I've had to learn those chords because they're in some songs that I've needed to learn, right. you know. So I know some jazz. Couldn't talk to you about the icons of jazz if you paid me money to do it. But if I'm into something, Look, even back when the Pistols came out, I was taught a long time ago that, great, you love the Sex Pistols, you've got to understand where they come from. Right. So in that case, you've got to know the New York Dolls, and you've got to know Johnny Thunders, and you've got to know the MC5, and the Stooges, and the Velvet Underground. You've got to understand where that kind of guitar-based anger came from. Um, you know, if you, if you listen to hip-hop, You've got to understand R&B and some of the soul that, that that came from because they were spinning soul records and R&B records uh, to get the beats, you right. know? So I mm. think if I'm, if I'm into something, I learned a long time ago to understand the history of it and where it comes from, just like art. If you, everyone loves Banksy. Banksy is a wonderful artist that uh, deserves everything and more that, that that he's got in this world. But you also have to understand where street art came from. Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Shepard Fairey, you know. It's good to know the history of what you're really into. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, well, it just, we have to study more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's study what you like. I, yeah. the, the worst thing in the world, I used to watch these 80s heavy metal documentaries. I love a good bit of heavy metal, Sunset Strip, hair metal, love all that shit. But I'd watch these guys, and I'm not going to name names, and they would get interviewed, and they did not have a clue why they were doing it. They did not have a clue. Like, let's take the New York Dolls, right? Okay. All these guys in the 80s, they had teased blonde hair and tight spandex pants and lipstick. They'd never heard of the New York Dolls. They were doing it because Guns N' Roses were doing it. Yes. Right? Okay. Who did understand the New York Dolls. Right. And I think that it's just a lot better if you can talk about why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. You know? Clearly, I can. Yeah, and that's true. Ozzy Osbourne, how often do you get to meet him? Because it's like you're always with him. Oh, meet him? No, he's my best friend. That's what I thought. It's no, like Ozzy's my best friend. It's not about meeting him. I mean, I'm. we have dinner so know, basically he's like hey I'm coming over oh a hundred percent wow oh no a hundred percent Ozzy's my best friend and, and I'm his for 30 odd years that's incredible no no we live five minutes from each other we're always I'm always over there that's incredible mm. yeah just watched you guys yesterday a um, new episode of the best of oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah pretty cool you mean the madhouse chronicles that the, oh yeah. the best so they did the best of so it, right. it had like the, the regular show you have to understand yeah. that I don't really know what they're putting out right you know i shot a bunch of stuff with ozzy months ago and uh what what the producers of that show are doing ozzy and my show is called the madhouse chronicles right but they do that jack's got a series and yeah. and uh you know the osborns themselves the family yeah. have got a series and i i did some stuff on that and then they cut it up and do the best of yeah. it it's great what they're doing they're owning their own content the family owns yeah. their own content you know yeah family's super popular yeah. Like um, even my grandmother, at one time, God yep. rest her soul. Yep. I met Ozzy in 2007. My grandmother had a picture of me and Ozzy on her fridge. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. 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 Even my grandmother, you know, 80 years Everyone old. Everyone loves time, Ozzy. Yeah. Ozzy was popular. Still is. Yeah. Legend. Yeah. And you're close to a legend. I mean, he's just my friend. You know, I don't. I don't look at him as a legend. I mean, I know the importance of Ozzy, but he's... There's people that take it really serious, though. You know, yeah, I mean, I take him seriously like, like my best friend. I yeah, would, I would protect him. That's cool. Uh, I don't look at him and think you're the singer of Black Sabbath. Yeah. I look at him and think, let's go out for dinner. Mm -hmm. Where are we going? You know. Imagine if you would um, 
hang out with him in 1980, 81. How it all oh, we'd been. both be dead. Yeah. <laughs> I, told, I told him that. I said, Ozzy, you're very lucky you didn't know me in 82. Yeah. Yeah, we'd both be dead. Yeah. The, the stories just keep on coming. Yeah. And it's all great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Everybody loves Ozzy. It's great stuff because he didn't die. Yeah. God, everyone needs to remember that. It's yeah. only funny because the guy didn't die. But yeah. we all could have died. Yeah. You know, me especially. So I'm, I'm glad we don't do that shit anymore. I'm glad too. Billy, one final thing here. Yeah. Um, Crack Cocaine, the music video. Mm -hmm. The song sounds almost like uh, if Zach Wilde's in it too. It just sounds like Ozzy Osbourne, all like 100% almost. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, that's great. <laughs> that was one of those moments. I mean, it, it was the music was written by me and Steve. Yeah, Steve Stevens at Steve's house. We were hanging out. We picked up two really cheap guitars. Didn't know we were making a record. Okay. We were not sitting there trying to write an Aussie song, but the guitars were detuned, which in, which is Aussie's tuning. And we were messing around, and between the two of us, we came up with a riff that was clearly, clearly an Aussie riff. And so, obviously, you know, Steve knows that Aussie's my best friend. So I called Oz and I said, Listen, I'm over at Steve's house. You might want to, you might want to come over. Yeah. And he came over and he heard it. He's like, Oh my God. And the song was written in a day. You know, it was it was clearly we were having one of those moments that are granted to you by the universe. Right. We, and the universe that day said, "Here you go, Billy and Steve. Here's a wonderful song for Ozzy." And Ozzy went, "I love it." And it, yeah. that was it was done. And how's the Billy Morrison project going? It's going well. I mean, everything has been halted because crack cocaine was in the charts for so long. Yeah. We have this, I mean, seven or eight singles planned. Good. you know and videos and there was a whole release date thing planned that we just stopped because crack cocaine took off like wildfire yeah and you want to capitalize yeah you that. don't want to yeah you want to don't want to ignore the fact that we're moving I got to number one yeah we had a number one rock song so now I think even today or maybe next week I can't remember we are announcing um, more videos more singles so the album is still very much alive and uh, I'm very grateful. It's a great vibe. I just find it's incredible what you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving me the honor to talk to you yeah, today. Yeah, of course. Um, to me, it uh, means a lot. Yeah. yeah. I hope you enjoy the show tonight. Oh my God. Yeah. Yes. We'll have a good time. Yeah. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>